Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is part three of the Overlord series. We now follow Private Martin Einig, who served with the 726th Infantry Regiment on Gold Beach. This is his story. In 1943 I was 17. I liked boxing and I was tall, but I had a chronic lung condition which technically made me unfit for active service. I had been a member of the Hitler Youth like all the young boys, but I was rejected from the labor corps because of my problematic breathing. Nevertheless, the army doctors correctly noted that my eyesight was slightly above average and so I was a valuable asset all the same. For these reasons, I served as part of a flak gun crew for several months around Munich and was then transferred to the Wehrmacht in the west, to the Atlantic Wall. My family were most relieved that I was sent to France, which we imagined as a true land of plenty. On arrival, I joined a beach battery sited near La Riviere. We distinguished between beach batteries, which were intended to fire at targets in the shallows or on the beach itself and coastal batteries, which were the much larger guns intended to fire long range at naval targets. My bunker was a concrete structure armed with two 88mm guns and embrasures, with the guns sighted on the beach itself. The bunker was positioned on a steep slope about 100 meters back from the sea wall, giving an enfilade field of fire along the beach. My rank was Zoldat and my duty was to be a spotter. If an attack came, I was to assist with manning the MG-34 machine gun which was sighted in the bunker to prevent infantry assault. We soldiers were housed in a fortified farmhouse several hundred meters from our bunker, this house being strengthened with concrete blocks, sandbags, earth ridges and corrugated iron. It was intended as a second line of defense, with a view down the slopes towards the seafront. Our life, by the standards of what most German soldiers experienced, was very soft, to be honest. Our military rations were basic, but these were amply supplemented by produce from local farmers and retailers, who had no compunction about trading food with us in exchange for cigarettes, gasoline and even leather for boot soles, none of which were available to civilians. When I read today about the French resistance, I am impressed at their tenacity, but if the readers of such books could see the trading that went on between us and the local French, they might form a different view of life in France at that time. Well, but this is perhaps a case of history being written by victors. Concerning my motivation for defending the Atlantic Wall I must say that my personal and political views in 1944 were quite different from today. Back then it was my belief that we were there to defend Europe against the multiple threats represented by the Allies. We saw the British as an outdated imperial force organized by Freemasons, who sought to turn the clock back 100 years to the days when their word was the law of the land practically all over the world. Why should they be entitled to install their Freemason puppet de Gaulle in France to rule as a proxy? The Vichy government, which was installed by the Reich, had three clear points in its propaganda regarding these threats to the French people. These were de Gaulle, Freemasonry and Communism. As for the American state, we perceived it as controlled by the forces of international high finance and banking, who wish to abolish national governments and have the world run by banks and corporations. And there was the definite sentiment that both these countries, England and the USA, were being manipulated and controlled by the Bolsheviks in Moscow. I stress that these were my views at the time and they weren't unique. They were very common views, in fact. Of course, I have since changed my opinions in this regard as I have learned more about the Third Reich, as we all have. I also never shared any personal animosity towards the Anglo-Americans. My brother and cousin had both been killed in the East, at Kharkov, so my animosity lay more in that direction. Ironically, we had a large contingent of Russian troops with us on the Atlantic Wall who were defectors and now serving in the German forces. But I had no real contact with them. As for the English, my father had been in France in 1917 to 1918, and he confided to me that the English were surprisingly similar to us Germans in personal character but that as a fighting force they were inconsistent. There were many brave men but also a big element of shirkers and slackers as well as black market operators. Regarding the Americans, I think that most of us soldiers made a distinction in our minds between the American government, which we believed was a pawn of international high finance, and the Americans as individuals. After all, we had all seen American movies and magazines before the war, we had read about cowboys and heard jazz music and all this was exciting and very attractive to us. But despite all this, 
we knew that the Americans were intent on attacking France and destroying the unification of Europe under German protection that our leadership had achieved. The phrase Fortress Europe is still widely remembered today I think, as part of Reich propaganda at the time, but I remember that the phrase United Europe was equally common. It was a universal slogan. We should remember that both the Wehrmacht and the Waffen SS had huge recruitment campaigns in all the countries under Reich control, with the emphasis that people from all the countries of Europe should unite under arms and defend European unification. If we look at the Waffen SS, we see these very effective non-German units from all over Europe, the French, the famous Belgian Walloon people under Leon de Grel, the Dutch, Norwegians, the Croat Muslims with their SS emblems on their Fez hats and so on and so on. There was a definite sense that Europe was united under the Reich and an attack on France would be an attack on the whole thing. I can say with certainty that we all thought the Allies would try to enter France in the north, so it was no surprise to me when it happened. Some of us said there may be another small-scale attack similar to the fiasco at Dieppe, perhaps attempting to capture another port such as Cherbourg or Calais, while others believed there would be a mass rebellion by the French resistance groups, armed and equipped by the Allies. But although the phrase the invasion was widely used after June 6, especially by the French, we did not really use it much before then. The scale of the June 6 landings when they actually happened was beyond what we had imagined to be possible. For my local bunker team specifically, our officers drummed the idea into our heads that the beach was a potential target for landings and it must be defended, but at the same time they liked to tell us what a disaster the English and Canadians had made of trying to land on the beach at Dieppe in 1942. We were often shown the newsreel films of Dieppe, with all the dead Allied troops and all their wrecked tanks and so on. There was also the danger of small-scale commando-type raids along the coast, which we did expect at any time. We knew the British especially were very dishonorable in these raiding parties, the prime example being the Saint-Nazaire atrocity in which they massacred a large number of unarmed German officers and French civilians. Incidentally, this is one point in which I have not changed my thinking since the war. The Saint-Nazaire raid was a deliberate massacre by the British. At any rate, I think our general feeling was that something would happen, but I for one certainly did not expect a major landing exclusively on the beaches, without the capture and use of existing ports or harbors. I thought that a pure beach landing was impossible, especially considering all the anti-landing obstacles which were built on the tidal range of the beach. These were metal girders welded in cross formations and among them timber posts set in concrete at about 45 degrees, intended to hold up boats or other craft approaching the shore. Most of them had a plate mine or an artillery shell attached to the obstacle at some point, being primed to detonate if a craft touched it. The artillery troops manning the two 88mm guns in my bunker regularly fired shells at certain markers along the beach to ensure their ranging was accurate. Their orders were to fire on craft approaching from the sea, prioritizing boats which had not yet hit an obstacle or that had reached the beach itself. They could also fire along the esplanade behind the sea wall if any attackers managed to climb over that wall into the town. My bunker had a substantial magazine of 88mm high explosive ammunition, which was kept in a central pit behind the gun platforms. The MG position to which I was assigned was a concrete slit fitted with an MG-34 on a gimbal mount set into the floor. Behind us, there was our fortified farmhouse and then there were further inland defenses, chiefly consisting of villages which were fortified and linked together with bunkers, to brook emplacements and resistance points. My memory of June 6 is as follows. I would really like to brag and claim that I was the first to sight the Allied ships, the invasion armada as the English press called it, but in fact I was not on observation duty at the time. On Monday evening, I had accompanied two of my comrades to a small bar in the nearby town which was friendly to Germans and we had stayed there for several hours. They served a very light red wine which we were very fond of and there were young ladies who would sit at our tables and talk to us. Of course, the amount of activity in the airspace overhead was very noticeable. The amount of bombing had become very intense over preceding weeks, but that night the noise of aircraft engines was constant and there was bombing to the south and west of us. All this caused the bar owner to close his premises early and we went back to our barracks, beneath all this aircraft noise, with a bottle of wine which we drank in our bunks. With all these things going on, we were asleep in the fortified farmhouse building until at about 5 a.m. our felt fable stormed in and began kicking us out of bed. I am not sure of the exact time, as the situation was unclear and confusing. 
but the felt fable was shouting, Angriff! Angriff! At this point we were still thinking of the event as a raid and not an invasion. We got dressed and took our rifles. In all there were about two dozen men assembling in the hallway and corridors. When we came out of the farmhouse, the light was still grey and the air was very cool. The first thing that I experienced was the increasing noise of aircraft, which was mounting and getting louder literally with every second that passed. Overhead, there was a large volume of planes visible and moving from north to south. I would say there were 50 or 60 aircraft which I think were medium bombers. There were also smaller, Spitfire type aircraft behind them and several of these also at low altitude. I had not seen a fighter plane so close before. They were perhaps 100 meters high. I experienced all of this very quickly, in a confused way, as we ran with our rifles along a sunken road which connected the farmhouse to the bunker. None of us spoke, we only followed our felt fable and reached the bunker quickly. We entered through a steel door which was then shut behind us and a steel locking beam was placed across it. I began to go up to the observation point which was my normal post, but the artillery officer ordered me to the MG position, saying that all men were needed to operate the guns. I remember that I ran into the position which was a concrete room set into the walls, where the MG-34 was positioned at the embrasure. The embrasure was a concrete slit about 1 meter wide at head height and the gunner stood on a platform to work the gun. Two men were already there, talking in an agitated way and manning the gun. I jumped onto the platform and looking through the slit I saw the situation in the channel. I was astonished at the number of craft. I could not estimate how many, but I recall that the closest was possibly a few kilometers from the low tide obstacles, while the furthest were literally on the horizon. These craft included destroyer-type warships, tugs and numerous small vessels which seemed to be invasion barges. There was a great variety of other boats. I was struck speechless at this sight which I had never imagined possible. The sheer number of craft was quite amazing. Even as I stared, more ships came into view, endlessly filling the sea. I remember, if I may be honest, that I began to tremble and I broke out in a sweat. I know I am not the only soldier in history to experience such a reaction when faced with the enemy and so I feel no shame in describing this. As I looked out of the slit again, I saw a fighter plane, I think a Mustang, coming towards us extremely low over the beach. The propeller was practically filling the visible sky in front of us. Before we could react this plane fired a short burst and I heard the bullets impact on the concrete exterior of the bunker. Then the plane pulled up and disappeared above us. It was so close that I could smell its exhaust fumes. It may sound strange, but I thought to myself, he wanted to kill us. This was the first time I had ever seen a shot fired in anger.